Olivia Amaro. Good morning, good morning everyone. It's always great to be in Paris, but even more so when we've gathered here to talk about innovation and sustainability. Now, I can say it's a packed house. I'm very happy to see so many of you joining us here today. I'm very excited to share with you the upcoming conversations on stage. Let me also say welcome to our online audience as these conversations are being live streamed on CNBC's social media platforms. Now, I'm very excited to introduce to you the first set of the conversations we're going to have on stage. So please join me in welcoming onto the stage one of the executives from Schneider. She is Gwenel Avis Ue, Executive Vice President of Europe Operations at Schneider Ledger. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you because I was sharing with Gwenelle backstage and I'll share it with you now that I get to spend a lot of time in Brussels. I cover European politics for CNBC and therefore I have the chance to speak to many of the policymakers there. And you probably have felt the same. I've noticed a change in narrative from many of the policymakers taking care of the European policy making. And this is where I would like to start our conversation, Gwen, because as we approach the European elections, it feels that policymakers are talking more and more about the need to address some concerns among our communities, that perhaps some of the climate targets are simply too aggressive. So this is where I would like to start, Gwen, and ask you really, do you notice this change in narrative, and are you worried that the EU is going to backtrack on some of the climate pledges? Well, very good question. <laughs> well, let me set the scene. Uh, you know, in the past years, European politicians have taken a bunch of commitments. One big commitment is around greenhouse gas emission reduction, 55% to reduce by 2030. And not only that, it's also targets on renewable, renewable energy to be up to 42.5% up to 2030. So big targets. The reality is that we lack action. That's why in the legislative campaign at the European Parliament, at the European Commission, we need to talk more about actions, less about the objectives that are set. Now it's all about actions. And maybe also to share where we stand so far in terms of mm -hmm. deliveries. You know, in the past year, in 2030, the fossil fuel consumption in Europe has dropped dropped by 19%, which is good news. And at the same time, renewable energy rose to a very record time, 44%. So this is good news. In reality, we could say actions are already paying off. The reality, the reality is that we are far from achieving the targets. If we continue like that, we will be short in time to deliver. Hence, in the discussion, more should be around actions, how to deploy faster renewable energy, how to make sure that energy savings is happening structurally, and not only because the economy is down or because the industry is down, but structurally we're working on energy demand. That's what we need in terms of discussion for the European elections. Very clear, action and less words to some extent. Exactly. But in Brussels, there's a lot of words, and one of the buzzwords at this stage is competitiveness. And everyone seems to be waiting for, uh, for this report from Mr. Mario Draghi on how to boost competitiveness in the EU for the next five years of policy making. But thinking about sustainability and thinking about competitiveness, hmm. how can we boost it? How can we deliver some of those actions to make sure that the continent is actually a true leader when it comes to sustainability? You know, competitiveness first starts with importing less energy. 
When we look at the European level, we are importing the equivalent of 1 billion spent per day. In total, it's an increase of the spend for energy imports of 600 billion in the past four years. So this is huge. How to compensate that? How to decelerate the energy imports? Then it's building more in the European Union. When we look at energy savings, Last year, we were at 3.4% of reduction of the energy consumption. We can do more. We have solutions in the building segment, in the industry segment, at home via prosumer, consuming energy, redu reduction of the consumption at the end because you monitor your energy. At the end of the day, we need more of that, more in the European Union. And sometimes we can think sustainability and competitiveness are opposed. On the contrary, they go hand in hand by improving sustainability, by investing into renewable energy, by investing into energy savings. Then we will increase our competitiveness. We will reduce our imports of energy. We will save money and we inject this money into the economy. Mm -hmm. That's the equation. And given that we are at the Innovation Summit, we can't forget about AI, another buzzword, if I may say. But of course, there's a question mark here about the true implication, the true impact, I should say, of artificial intelligence when it comes to the new energy landscape, because we all know that we need a vast amount of energy just to keep it running. So from your point of view, Gwen, do you think that AI can actually make a true, a, a positive difference when it comes to energy in the European Union? You know, AI is already part of our life, and it will only accelerate because when it comes to sustainability, it's all about electrification, automation, and digitalization. It will not happen without digitization. Let me just give you one example. You know, in current buildings, everybody has in mind that decarbonization will have, you know, tremendous investments into the buildings, in order to renovate buildings, into, in terms of retrofitting on the buildings. In reality, there are solutions that are depending on what we call connected products. Through AI, with artificial intelligence, you can optimize very rapidly the consumption in the building. This is one segment, just the building segment. You know, this kind of solution can reduce the consumption by 40% with investments and return on investments in less than five years. I just want to give you one example like this one to showcase that sustainability will require more digitalization. We cannot fight against that. The question is how to improve technology. Hence investments into R&D. Hence investments into innovation just to make sure that new technology will emerge to become more efficient in using AI, but we need desperately AI in order to perform better and save energy. The question of investments is also very, very important. And when looking at some of the renewable companies, it's clear that there's a set of challenges for every player. You, we just have high interest rates, as those are still there, of course, they're still putting pressure on companies. You have trade barriers. Given all of the challenges, when I was just wondering if the only answer is actually government subsidies. Where is the investment going to come from at this time? Well, first, we talk a lot about renewable energy, but again, remember that to achieve sustainability, it's half renewable energy, greening the supply, half of the equation is the demand, working on the demand. Okay. When we have said that, looking at renewable energy, what happened in the past year? 73 gigawatts were installed in Europe, 73. The bulk of it was solar, 56. 56 was solar. Competitiveness of solar has increased dramatically in the past years. And at the same time, 17 gigawatts of installed capacity of wind. Again, is it enough? No, it's not enough. We would need to double or to be up to 37 gigawatt to reach the target on renewable energy by 2030. This demonstrates that we need action. Do we need more money? In reality, we just need to execute, meaning one good example for wind. It's not that the projects are not existing. It's not that subsidies require uh, higher. It's just that permitting is so complex. To develop a wind farm, it can take lots of, lots mm. of years. 
In the past year, at the contrary, the European Commission has taken a decision to accelerate permitting. This is exactly what we need. Acceleration all the administrative staff in order to go smoother in the transition. Thanks to this legislation, how the backlog of wind farm have evolved. You know, today projects have increased by 70, 70% in Germany, 70% in Spain, and 20% in France. It's just showcasing. It's not only about money. It's administration, how to go faster, how to have smoother process so that instead of doing permitting procedures, we go faster and we develop. That's the purpose of you know, the kind of actions that we need to accelerate. It's very clear. Um, I just have one a final question, which is obviously looking at the SMEs that are trying to make a change in this space. Schneider Electric has huge resources, a huge company. But given your experience, what words of wisdom to some extent would you share with now smaller companies that are trying to make a difference, perhaps could become also bigger companies going forward? It's a very good question because when it comes to sustainability, it's not something that is the privilege of the big companies. On the contrary, achieving the targets requires that everybody across the journey is doing the same direction. Nevertheless, you're right. Small companies, they don't necessarily have all the means, all the tools to understand and to decarbonize efficiently. And that's how we need to partner. We had exactly this experience. You know, when we look at our emissions, part of it is on the upstream, our suppliers, part of it is on our customers, and the rest is us. The bulk of our emissions are downstream and upstream. That's why decarbonization is working across the value chain, embarking everybody across the value chain. We had to do that for our suppliers. We took a commitment to decarbonize our top 1,000 suppliers by 50% in 2025. That sounds easy. In reality, that was hugely complex. Many of our suppliers were small companies that didn't know how to do a roadmap, how to calculate carbon footprint. Sounds easy, but in reality, it's much more complex. And thanks to this journey with our own suppliers, we have developed tools in order to accelerate the path for other companies that have the same questions about their own suppliers. Hence, it's how we scale, not only working with our suppliers, but the suppliers of our customers. That's how we see an impact company. That's all what Schneider is about. Very clear. Thank you, Gwenel. Please, let's give a round of applause to Gwenel Avis Uwe, Executive Vice President at Schneider Electric. Thank, Thank you so much. We'll Thank see you later. <laughs> Before I introduce to you the next conversation, I want to show you this introductory video that is really going to set the scene for the next round of discussions. The energy transition is happening, and faster than many realize. According to the IEA, a major swing to renewables meant we saw just a 1.1% increase in global energy emissions last year, and that the potential to do even better is there. If the world can boost energy efficiency by more than 4% annually by 2030, we could be on track to cut CO2 emissions by a third. Those that embrace the energy transition early on have already benefited. But are the old guard fully on board? Many oil and gas executives say they want to be part of the clean energy transition. Only 2.5% of their investment go to clean energy and 97.5% go to their traditional operations. So there is a major, major gap, to say the least, what they say they would do and what they do in terms of their investment strategies. People need to realize the vast sheer size and scale of the world's energy system seems to be beyond the grasp of many people who just want oil and gas to disappear overnight. We've got to, we've got to bring it down and come up with renewables, not just renewables, nuclear has got to be a big part of it. We've got to do it sensibly, because if you turn off oil and gas, the world will not do very well. Technology can be of service, but while improvements in efficiencies have helped limit increasing energy requirements such as data centers so far, the boom in energy-thirsty AI will offer new challenges for electricity supply. 
the computing power required for AI is estimated to double every 100 days, and it's expected to increase by more than a million times over the next five years. Ironically, AI could help generate solutions. Then, this funding. Innovations in sustainable finance are creating unprecedented levels of capital, which plays a crucial role in improving access to clean energy and can help clean tech companies scale up their operations. In a world that needs to dramatically expand its energy production to meet increasing demand and at the same time fundamentally decrease the carbon intensity of that energy, what obstacles stand in the way of a green energy transition and what technologies and innovations will help overcome them? Welcome to CNBC's IoT, powering the digital economy debate as we focus on the new energy landscape. And so to continue our conversation on this new energy landscape, I'm very pleased to introduce to you my next panel. I have with me Mary Duizaki, she's Chief Sustainability Officer at Cisco, Caroline Hargrove, Chief Technology Officer at Ceres, and Bertrand Picard, Swiss Explorer and President of the Solar Impulse Foundation. Thank you to the three of you for joining me on stage. Um, I would like to start with you, Mary, and uh, maybe you don't know, but Mary has actually been the first Chief Sustainability Officer of Cisco. It's obviously a very important role, and given on what we also just heard in the video there, just set the scene for us and tell us how do you assess the current energy landscape? The first thing I might mention is now I want to be an explorer, so <laughs> that will be my next role. Um, so the first thing that you think about is um, what kind of energy. So we know that this is the decade that we need to take action. So when I think about energy, it's the availability of cleaner energy, that renewable energy. Um, and I do think it's available. There is increasing demand. Just recently at COP28, there was an, a commitment to increase the amount of renewable energy by um, a third, so this is critical. But it's also dependent upon digital infrastructure and the grid itself. Do you have a smart, modern, secure grid? So I think that now is the time for investment. Now is the time for us to collectively sing signal that we need more cleaner energy now to be ready by 2030, 2040, and 2050. And you have access to a lot of data. You are helping customers understanding how they use their energy. And so I was just wondering from obviously what you can share with us, what are you learning from this set of data? Yeah, you know, one of the things when I think about Cisco, it, it basically securely connects everything to make anything possible. So as you mentioned, there's hundreds of thousands of data points that you can observe. And what that tells you is one, our customers are looking for ways that they can manage more effectively their energy consumption. They want to know, well, how much are we consuming? What are those energy resources, the energy sources? But they also want to be able to know when can they turn things off or put them in idle. So when you think about how in the past we would turn on, let's say, a, a particular port in a data center or maybe your collaboration um, suite, now you have the ability to actually sense and know where's the demand and put things in idle, which is significant energy savings there. And all of this information we now need for not just our voluntary disclosures, but it's now becoming part of our financial disclosures as well, how much energy we consume. Very interesting. I would like to look now more in more detail at the corporate element here because Ceres works with green hydrogen and I was also very fascinated to hear to read about this company in Iceland, the Carbons Capture. And they were also making the point that they are here to prove that these sort of businesses can be profitable, but of course the next challenge is scaling up. So thinking about that, Carolina, how do you think that you can scale up and why is it so hard really to help companies get bigger? Well, I've worked in, in technology all my life and one of the things often you have to do is project what the future might look like. And I saw coming into this hall, there's a lot here of people doing these sort of digital twins. And when you mention that in a sector where there's a lot of immaturity, like in clean tech, there is no other way to 
to move faster than to do a lot of modeling and simulation to see what it might look like. Because in green electrolysis, which is what I'm um, working on sort of making um, green hydrogen, to see whether an electrolyzer will work for 10 years at a very high efficiency, you have to run it for 10 years at a very high efficiency. We don't have that yeah. time. We have mm. to move much faster than this. So what do we do? We need to model it and, and keep learning. We need to make lots of tests to learn from our models. And then, so that's the scaling part that is more technical, but there's also the whole supply chain that we need to think about. Because recently, one of our one megawatt demonstrators, have, we have actually shipped it over to, um, to India. And one of the reasons it can't work immediately is that we're wait, working on, waiting on, DC-DC converters, because there's quite a, you know, a backlog of, of them in our supply chain, because there's a lot of people who are trying to electrify everything. Even moving our factory, we're a startup sort of scale up, in the scale up phase, um, we're about 600 people, we developed this technology, we wanted to move to a new site in the UK. We couldn't even find a site that had enough power to run our electrolyzers in our test stands. And we're told on some of the sites it would be three years, other seven years to be grid connected. So all of this is actually stopping clean tech startups like ours to really go faster. And that brings me to my next point, really, which is regulation. And uh, so many companies have complained to me about how particularly this part of the world, Europe, is, has way too much regulation, how hard that is for companies to progress and to work here. Do you feel that that's the case? Do you think regulation at this stage in the block is actually a hinder for the progress when it comes to sustainability? Yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's interesting because regulations, you know, we work in, in hydrogen and we were having conversations earlier about hydrogen safety. This is really important, especially when you're doing hard to abate sectors, you're in industrial settings, you've got heat, you've got pressure, yeah, hydrogen, oxygen in these circumstances. Yeah, you've got to have safety. It's important and I'm not taking this lightly, but I think what we mainly need at this point is supporting policy, we need a carrot and stick, we need some, some goal setting that we don't back out of. Mm. So we need investment in these type of technologies to take some of the risk away, and that is a five, ten year investment. This is not two years. And, and so I would say that having things like um, maybe imposing a, an end to grey hydrogen when you need the hydrogen molecules, for example, in an industrial application, you're up against you know, steam methane reforming that have been there for decades. They're highly optimized systems based on fossil fuels. If we are to green it, we need courage to do this, but we often need policies that sets, okay, you've got to do it by this time. Encourage investment. When it comes to some of the targets, that the EU has, though. There, there's a couple that are very clear, and uh, one of them is reach, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. At the moment, though, European officials have said that we are not on track, so more needs to be done. But I want to look at the renewable part of the market in more detail with you, Bertrand, because I was also fascinated to read on how national plans in the EU at this stage are not yet sufficient to meet the renewable power needs by 2030. So we're talking in five years' time, basically. Why? Why are we not having more ambitious targets and plans? The first thing to understand is that in the world, we waste three quarters of the energy that is produced. Wow. Not only with bad behaviors, but mainly because of old, outdated, and inefficient systems and infrastructures. So we waste energy, but also when we waste water, it's energy that we waste. When we waste uh, th uh, a third of the food produced, it's also the energy needed to produce the food. So we, we live in a world of waste. So if we try to replace fossil energy with renewables without being efficient, without reducing the consumption, it's, it's hopeless. 
So we need two pillars. We need to become efficient, and this is the type of solutions that Schneider Electric is bringing to reduce energy consumptions in building, in the industry, in the data centers, in agriculture, everywhere. And of course, you need to put more renewables, but if you save energy, you don't need to introduce so much percentage of renewable energy. And what we see in Europe, and mainly in big countries in, in the world, is that we think that renewable energy is only wind and solar. But it's much more than that. You know, in, in Europe, they had excluded biogas mm. from the taxonomy. Biogas can be made with waste from cities or from agriculture. You have hydroelectricity in small rivers that can feed electricity in villages. You can put micro turbines in the, in the water pipes, you know? You, you have geothermy. 99% yeah. of the mass of the planet is more than 1,000 degrees Celsius. And people forget about geothermy. So we focus on producing more instead of consuming less. Mm -hmm. And in the production that we want to do, we forget a lot of different types of renewable energies that we don't take into consideration. So at the end, we, we miss the target. And we miss the fact that we can have cheaper energy because renewables are much cheaper already today, almost everywhere in the world. And if you have cheaper energy that is produced locally with local jobs and for a cheaper price, you have more competitiveness. Mm. So, so every country wants to be energy independent, more competitiveness, and they forget that the only way to reach it is by energy efficiency, and, and uh, renewables. So ultimately, the strategy seems actually simpler than the, the way that we are designing it thus far. But I want to look at the solar industry in more detail um, because there's a clear, clear concern among policymakers that perhaps in this continent, the European solar industry will actually reduce its operations because of oversupply from China. So my question to you, and given your work in when it comes to solar, is what is the future for the European solar industry if nothing changes? It's a bit of a paradox, because the Chinese have killed the European solar industry, but they have saved the world by showing that solar energy can be so cheaper than anything else. In, in Portugal, which is not far from here, you have solar electricity at 1.5 cents, 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. And recently, the Emirates have beaten it with one cent per kilowatt hour. And of course, you need a cheap production of, of, of solar. So you can say it's a disaster because uh, China, China is taking all the markets. But on the other hand, even if you buy the Chinese solar panels in Europe, you produce cheaper electricity, and you are much more competitive than with fossil fuels and with the coal or gas imported from, from Russia. So it's, it's a paradox, but I think we really have to see which is the advantage that mm. we can gain out of it. But is there an understanding, do you think, that this is a key industry and therefore also needs more support? Well, you can put more support and try to compete, but you can also take the cheap solar panels from China and do something valuable here. Mm. For example, to use this electricity to produce hydrogen. And then you can develop a local production of hydrogen, because hydrogen, especially if it's liquid, is not so easy to transport. So you can have electricity used for hydrogen production. You can have a solid battery uh, industry, also in, in Europe, you, you, you can develop other things, thanks to the cheap uh, panels from, from China. And, and I think, you, you know, instead of fighting against the obstacle, mm -hmm. I think you need to use the situation to see how there will be outcomes on the side of the problem that can, that can be beneficial for us. And uh, I think there's a lot to do in, in Europe, uh, maybe thanks to the cheap solar energy. Otherwise, nobody will use the, the solar energy. You know, when I initiated the solar impulse project to fly around the world on a solar airplane, 
it was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. solar energy was 40 times more expensive than it is today. Oh, wow. So I'm sorry, maybe it's not politically correct, but I'm thanking China for the decrease of price of solar energy that has given a wonderful push to renewable energies. We would not be at this point without China. Yeah, for those who don't know, I should have mentioned at the start, Bertin has actually done a non-stop round-the-world trip that was essentially using a solar-powered aircraft without any fuel. So maybe some inspiration there um, for some of us. Um, I want to go back to the issue of artificial intelligence. As I was discussing with Gwen earlier, she made the point that naturally AI is already with us. But when it comes to this new energy landscape, Mary, do you think it can actually make a positive difference here? And how? Yeah. And as you heard, right, we're already using artificial intelligence and machine learning. When I talked about energy management, imagine what it can do to really analyze consumption and provide the optimal energy mix. It also could be used, for example, in really sophisticated preventative man um, maintenance. Imagine that. Now you don't have to replace product, so you reduce embedded carbon there as well. I also think what it can do, imagine um, the world with Internet of Things or IoT devices out there in nature. The ability for us to provide more and more data to analyze, to move from crisis response from a severe weather event to resilient and adaptive communities. So just like other technologies, there will be an efficiency play here that we've got to really manage be really thoughtful about it as well. But when I think about using this capability to analyze multiple inputs to design the most energy efficient, the most reusable, the most remanufacturable, the most easily upgradable, from a circular economy perspective, it could be a huge benefit as well. well can, can I add a point of course. on this one? Because to Bertrand's point earlier, I, I, you know, I've been working in, in modeling simulation. I worked in Formula One for 20 years, and, and this was bread and butter. But what scares me mm -hmm. is this: is the energy consumption. If you're using ChatGPT, if we all just use ChatGPT for a simple query, we're using 30 times more energy than doing a Google search. And to your point earlier, if we don't actually manage that as well, I mean, then the perverse effect could happen that we use it so much more energy. So as much as I'm a big fan and using the data to really optimize everything, we should use it to reduce our consumption, but the, the perverse effect can happen when you have a new toy and, and people getting behind it at so a rate. Really becoming they, responsible users of it where we know it can add the benefit and not just use it because it's potentially fun. But do you think, I'll just throw this point and please join in. Is, is there so much hype that people forget about the other side of AI? And obviously being the, how much energy it uses, Bertrand? No, I think AI, if it is well managed, is a fantastic way to reduce energy consumption. And for example, in the smart grids, opposed to the stupid grid we have today, mm. the smart grid will integrate intermittent renewable energy, with stock, with storage, with the distribution, with the consumption, which means that almost no energy will be lost. So this is the things that give me hope. But before going to AI, hmm. I just would like to ask in the room if they are aware of what happens today in terms of waste of energy. You know, one third of the electricity in the world is used by electric motors in the industry. Many of them are pumps that pump powders, gases, uh, liquids, and so on. Do you know how they manage the flow? You would think everybody uses the Schneider management of pumps to reduce the RPM, slow down the pump if you need less flow. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. They increase the, the, the resistance in the tube and they keep the pump full power. This is the type of ridiculous things that, that happen every day in our world. Everything is like this. So 
Speaking about renewables is wonderful. Speaking about efficiency is wonderful. But what we basically, basically need to do is to modernize our world, mm -hmm. to get rid of all the old systems that have been invented at the beginning of the oil era when we had all the energy needed, cheap and polluting, but we didn't care. And now we have to replace all this with the modern systems. And it will make the world efficient, clean, but also more profitable. You know, because you save so much energy that your profit margin is mm. higher and it pays for the upfront investment. So we have to, to think that way, that ecology basically is not just to protect the environment, it's also to protect our economy. And we need to put protection of the environment at the core of the economic development. And this will increase not only quality of life, but also environment and also the economy and the purchase power. Perhaps, though, there's um, a bit of a lack of uh, explaining that to yes. normal, ordinary citizens, right? That this is also something that we can do in our day-to-day. -day. We're approaching the end of our conversation, but I, I want to end on uh, just looking at the upcoming five years. Obviously, here we're going to have European elections, 2030 being a critical year when it comes to some of these sustainability targets. I just wonder, starting with you, Mary, when you look at the next five years, how does the energy landscape look like? And I think to build on, Breton, mm -hmm. it is really at that twin transition, investing in both digital and green. And I think encouraging policies that enable that as well as, um, this is where to me, public-private partnerships are critical. The ability for us collectively to also invest in those new nature-based or new green technologies that we're going to need in 5, 10, 15 years, where we can invest so that we're not only taking lab um, capability into the field to enable it to scale. And what I see on the energy side is continuing to really enable the energy management, optimization, the ability for us to report. Because one of the things when you hear we're off track or on track, it may be we don't have reliable data to understand exactly where we are as well. Critical. Caroline. Well, actually, to build on Mary's point as well, is the fact that we've got to get used to a distributed energy system. That's quite different in most countries to what we have today. But that, this is when we need to invest a lot more in renewables. Renewables are cheap. Solar is cheap. We need to use it. We need to deploy it. We, we're starting to do this. In countries like France here, you have nuclear using some of the base load to produce pink hydrogen is also a good idea because there are some industrial applications that will not de decarbonize unless you use hydrogen. And I'm not a hydrogen evangelist, but, but there are hydrogen molecules that are needed in things like steel. If you want to make cheap solar panels, cheap wind farms, you need a lot of steel. And that steel is currently very not green today. And Bertrand, what do you think we're going to be looking at in the next five years? And perhaps a thought also on nuclear. I believe that we have to understand that we have on one side a lot of green activists who believe there are no solutions and the only way to do is to degrow the economy. And on the other side, you have the economy who says we don't want to degrow, so we don't want to become green, we don't want to support the ecologist. And you have this cleavage where nobody actually can, can find a common ground. So we have to understand that we need to find the common interest between the ecologists who want to protect the environment, the socialists who want to give a better purchase power to the poorest people, and this can be done thanks to cheaper energy that must be renewable. Uh, you need to develop the economy and have job creation, that's the center right. The far right is fighting against ecology, but it makes no sense because renewables increase the energy independence, the energy sovereignty. So basically, you have something for all the parties. Mm -hmm. And instead of fighting against each other, taking climate action or protection of the environment as a hostage to destroy each other and gain more voices for the next elections, they should get ecology out of this hostage politic. They can fight on everything else, mm -hmm. but they can agree on the common ground of having cheaper energy, of having more energy efficiency, of having new sources 
of technology that will make our world uh, more modern. Uh, so it, at the end, it's a political problem. The solutions exist, but they are not implemented enough, mm -hmm. and we need the politicians to have this consensus that going for the solutions that exist, that modernize our world, make it more efficient, cleaner, and more profitable is the way to go. Very clear. Let's see what will happen. But it was such an insightful conversation. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists, Mary Dimitoki, uh, Caroline Hardgrove, and Bernard Pekka. Thank you Good all. Time. And I hope you've enjoyed the session, and of course, that you continue to enjoy the rest of the Innovation Summit. And please now enjoy your coffee break. Thank you.